Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, I would like to show you the objective test data on base cabinet number 1798 and uh, some of my listening impressions. And so um, just to do a quick recap here on this, I introduced this design a while ago. Um, this was the uh, original kind of design here and it has the horn flare geometry comprised of two straight sections and then it has like the wrap around. So the goal here was to kind of uh, an attempt to kind of closely follow the ES horn flare geometry by making it out of straight sections. Um, but right before we went to do the build, I decided to change the design and add another segment. So a third segment just to uh, allow the horn flare geometry to more closely follow the optimal curve. And so uh, the, that looks like this. You can see we got three uh, curves, three straight sections in there to really kind of closely follow the, the ES curvature. And I believe the maximum deviation uh, from, from a perfect curve was only about eight millimeters uh, from this from this design and so uh, really it's a kind of a good compromise in terms of build uh, simplicity versus you know trying to achieve that perfect horn flare geometry so um, so that's what we did uh, right before the we commissioned the build here and so you can see uh, the actual build uh, in its finished state just as an empty cabinet um, this is shown with the TAD driver in place and then the ES290 uh, by radial on top so the cabinet turned out really well. It's made from 24 millimeter thick Baltic birch plywood and then it has the solid walnut accents that forms the vents top and bottom. So you can see here the driver kind of hiding in behind. So the specific model used is the TAD TL1601B and we're using a two to one compression ratio in the throat. And so what that means is that the throat area is only 50% of the SD of the driver, SD being the surface area, the radiating surface area of the driver. And so um, based on simulations, that's kind of a general area that you wanna be with the two to one compression ratio to provide the optimal uh, sensitivity gain uh, through its operating bandwidth, which is, um, around 100 hertz up to around uh, 600 hertz and so um, just to, yeah just do good segue into uh, what we discussed in the original post uh, with that is show you uh, here from previous designs the response is you have the normal kind of base reflex cabinet here uh, tuning frequency and then it uh, moves into the gain provided by the short horn, which is a modest gain of around 5 dB. And so you can see these legacy designs uh, and you kind of have the same trend in the frequency response where you have a gain in sensitivity. Um, so anytime you have that gain there, you're going to have lower distortion uh, simply by the driver not having to work nearly as hard to produce the same output SPL. And so um, what you're trying to achieve here is re reduce distortion, pattern control, and physical time alignment with the high frequency compression driver. And so in my design, the horn is actually only, thir only 30 centimeters deep, which actually corresponds to the depth of the ES290, which is 30 centimeters deep as well. And so you're getting perfect physical time alignment between the, the woofer and the compression driver. Okay, so I'm going to move right into uh, some of the test data. Um, you can see here some more photos of the build. Um, this is just shown with the rear cover removed. And so all of my testing is going to be done with a solid rear cover. Um, we're not, I haven't done the louvers yet. That's something that I'm going to be doing in the coming weeks. Sorry, I said I was going to get to the measurements, but there's there's more to show. So this photo is good um, because it gives you a good sense of the overall size of the cabinet. And so for the testing, it was done at my brother's living room. And so it was positioned out from the wall by about a meter. And so it, the speaker was positioned to provide uh, a good sound stage. And so the reason I bring that up is uh, simply because we're not trying to corner place the cabinet to provide the target frequency response. We're actually um, getting the target frequency response with the cabinet away from the walls and we're not relying on the room boundary reinforcement to provide that base response. And so just to make that clear. 
Um, so we'll start with the impedance curve. You can see here the tuning frequency is at 32 hertz, which uh, was the target for this design. You can see here us putting it into place. Actually, that's my brother reaching in behind. Um, we were adjusting the uh, polyfill inside the cabinet, trying to optimize that. So now here's with my voltmeter, just checking the sensitivity. Uh, 2.83 volts, which is uh, which corresponds to a one watt input power if you're using an 8 ohm driver. And my decibel meter here, you can see um, with a 100 hertz test tone signal that the sensitivity uh, in room is 101.5. So that's really good, 101.5. So um, that's uh, really good for the low power tube amplifier enthusiasts. So here's the resulting frequency response. Um, you can see here the tuning frequency coming in a little bit. Um, probably we could go a little lower with that and kind of smooth that out. And then you can see here starting at around 100 hertz, we have a, a rise in the response uh, due to the, the effects of the horn. And then you have the breakup uh, in the diaphragm from the, the woofer here at around 1800 hertz. And so if we um, just apply some smoothing to those results, we can kind of get a general sense of uh, the trend on the response. Now, this is ungated um, in a living room environment, so obviously you're going to get some room reflections introducing some peaks and dips in the response. So just uh, keep that in mind. So I implemented a simple low pass filter using a four millihenry inductor and then you can see the effect with the green line here on the response now after this I did try a 7.5 millihenry inductor and it even further uh, flattened the response to the point where you didn't have this uh, little bump here at 100 Hertz it was pretty much linear uh, through its pass band and then it had a steeper uh, uh, slope there at around uh, 500 Hertz um, so I conducted distortion at 85 and 95 dB, starting with harmonic, and so um, the second harmonic is only 0 0.048, uh, extremely, extremely low, the lowest that I've measured uh, from any base solution. So um, I've shown the, uh, the graph with the vertical scale either in percent here or uh, the same test but shown with the vertical scale in dB. Just for reference, you can see there that the second harmonic is a full 65 dB down. And um, you can see what the third and fourth harmonics are. Fourth harmonic is 81 dB down, so extremely low. Um, even if we increase the test SPL to 95 dB at one meter, we can see that harmonic remains low at only a uh, quarter percent out of 100 hertz and so extremely low numbers here uh, certainly below the threshold of audibility uh, on the harmonic side um, so if we switch over to intermodulation um, if we're comparing the uh, peaks of the fundamental test tones here against the artifacts down below this black grass area if we compare those uh, that difference there we're at uh, 60 db on the intermodulation distortion with an 85 dB test signal. Uh, raising the SPL uh, to 95, we still have extremely low IMD, um, which is about a quarter percent. So these numbers are extremely low for base. Um, so uh, extremely happy to see this happening. And even uh, into the 500 Hertz region, we don't see um, distortion rising due to modulation. It's, it still remains low. Um, I suspect that that's a uh, uh, factor of two things. First, the horn, but also I think the TAD woofer is really showing off here as well on uh, with the, the uh, extremely low distortion, even into the mid bass and, and mid range. So now I, w I really was keen on uh, getting the off axis polar map on this base cabinet simply because we want to see if the large horn lens is providing pattern control and if it is how low is it actually going down to so are we getting pattern control at 300 hertz 200 hertz um, so I had to move the speaker cabinet to my father's uh, farm shop so you can see it's quite dirty uh, but I was still able to get uh, measurements in this larger space and that wasn't going to be affected by room boundaries and that. So now I integrated it with the ES290 using a passive crossover at 500 hertz. 
and so you can see uh, the resulting polar map here as a system okay so this is uh, the ES290 coming in at 500 Hertz and so what you're seeing here is at around 120 Hertz the large horn or waveguide if you want to call it that is providing pattern control um, it's really even and consistent and uh, controlled down to around 120 Hertz which is really nice to see um, that's going to translate into improved clarity at the listening position uh, because it's not going to be activating those early sidewall reflections in your room and um, you know uh, you're going to get a lot more direct sound which um, based on my experience um, with horns larger is better you're getting more pattern control and so that's the goal here is getting that large scale horn sound and so um, looking at the overlay between the low and the high frequency you can see here um, and then I moved the microphone four meters away in the, with this black trace to get an overall uh, response and I've smoothed it just so you get a general idea um, it's very difficult to to get you know gated measurements when we're getting down into the base so um, you're gonna see uh, some some irregularities there so um, one day hopefully I'll have a anechoic chamber but uh, the, the compression driver that was used for this test was the Celestian AXI 2050 uh, which I'll be doing a future video on so uh, concluding remarks on this so um, we are checking off all the boxes on this design for what our goal our goals were with the low bass extension high sensitivity um, we're getting extension up to around the one kilohertz region uh, we do see a mechanical breakup at around 1.8 kilohertz in which case we want to have a steep filter at around 800 hertz um, what i did is i went with a 500 hertz first order and that was acceptable um, this is shown actually as a third order um, but subsequent to this i actually changed it to just a first order and i did prefer uh, the sound uh, with the first order on both the low and high frequency and it had uh, textbook perfect step response um, and just had an uh, excellent coherency that would be on par with um, you know the same coherency that you would get with uh, single four inch drivers or coaxial drivers so um, really good results here um, the sound quality in the bass was excellent um, great clarity overall I mean obviously um, you, can, you can see there from the from the test data um, so we uh, built two pairs of these cabinets one pair was going to a customer and then the other uh, pair isn't really spoken for this is the pair that's uh, the second pair that we built and it's been sprayed with some poly and a satin finish which I think looks really nice um, so yeah uh, the TAD drivers are available um, they're a few weeks lead time uh, they're made to order in Japan it's nice that they are still available uh, they're really nice drivers uh, built really well and I think um, they do have kind of like a warm character to the sound that is not compressed in any way so it's like you get the best of both worlds you got extreme dynamics but also this kind of fluid warm rich sound uh, from the driver um, so it's 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 really nice so it's definitely um, because it's commercially available I think it will be my go-to driver for the more upscale uh, systems um, see here oh I guess my internet died there but um, I was going to show you the overall dimensions. So it's about 48 uh, inches wide um, by 22 inches deep. So just for reference there, if you're looking at your space and seeing if you can accommodate something like this. But uh, so there you have it. Uh, what's not to like on base cabinet 1798. So that's it. So take care and have a great day.